Hey, thanks for joining me. It is a very, very special day today, tonight, for the Hits FM story. 30 years since the first ever broadcast of Hits FM in Melbourne. Only went for nine days, it happened from a school in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne and only covered just a few suburbs. But uh, tonight I've got two of the people who were very much there from the very beginning, Nick Carlos and Miff Trant. And on the line I have co-founder Nick Carlos. G'day Nick. Hey good. Hey everybody. Thank you very much yeah, for definitely. taking the call. And I'd like to rewind time back to the early 90s now. And at that time, I believe you were working at a, a youth centre at um, Forest Hill out in the eastern suburbs. And you used to get a, a, a little newsletter, didn't you? Once a month that told you what That's was going right, on. Yeah. And there was a, a particular newsletter that came in late 91. So I was looking at that and just uh, reading in the thing, like, well, this sounds quite interesting. Uh, someone wanted to set up a radio station. So, um, so I looked, looked into it because I was into music a lot. I never thought about radio, but when I saw this, I thought, wow, this sounds so exciting. So I got in touch with, uh, obviously, Anton, the, the mastermind behind it. That's right. Now, um, in those in those early days, you were, you were putting little um, leaflets into schools asking people to fill out a form, weren't you, and, and say yeah, little, what, what they wanted on a radio station. Yeah, it was ballots uh, from memory. I think it was ballots to uh, just get your favourite um, music, it might have been also favourite issues, but there was, I think from memory it was all related to uh, the, 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 the music that they wanted to hear. Yes, So indeed. we could be relevant and play the music people wanted. Um, like you were obviously working with young people, what was the leap? How, how did you leap from working with young people to, to you know, helping start up this youth radio station? What, how did you yeah. get there? Yeah, generally, it was like I saw opportunity for not only for myself, but really for other for young people to be able to have opportunities to get involved and learn about um, presentation skills, learn about confidence, motivation, creativity. So by getting involved in the station, that brought all those sort of things together. Yeah, and you mentioned um, before the uh, the news part of Hits FM because that was a very special thing back in those days. You know, most suburban community radio stations wouldn't have a, a news department at all. They just take news off a satellite or something. Whereas um, Anton actually, you know, very early on said, no, we, sh we should make around news. Uh, I always thought that was quite impressive. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was really critical, but it also presented youth information, uh, also the current issues um, that were happening at that time in, in media. But it was just generally giving young people a chance to, to learn the skills of presenting a, a bulletin. I, I don't know if you were there on the first night. I was there and we got on air at about 10 o'clock finally got it to air because, you know, I think we almost metaphorically held it together with sticky tape. We, we, we got on the radio and, and Anton was hosting and he, he kind of got everyone to come in and, and say hello. And then off we, off we went, nine days of um, playing our own music. Um, you know, we had virtually no money. This was all done virtually on no money on the... The smell of an oily rag, really. And the amazing thing with um, this this first one that we're celebrating tonight, 30 years, with the, the nine days of John Gardner, was that um, we had one phone line, but we had, what, 1,200 phone calls for the week, or which is just... Yeah, it was quite busy. Yeah, it was a, a, quite a lot of calls coming through. And that was so, that was only <laughs> over a few suburbs. Like, you know, we weren't we weren't Melbourne-wide at that, at that case. Just to uh, get the response initially, uh, something just so new, like, to get such a big response, that gave us a real motivation to obviously keep on going for further broadcast. Anton had this dream. He, he knew where it could all go. He knew what the possibilities were. He was, like I said, the mastermind. And I, and I, you know, I appreciate everything he, he did for, for, for getting the station together and for giving us all the opportunities and the links to get involved. I was going to ask you, Nick, um, if you wanted to just reflect momentarily on, on the promotions thing, because that was what you were in charge of. You were, you know, having teams of people who would go out and they would put stickers on things and they would, you know, talk to young people and DJ events and so forth. Uh, Certainly, yeah, promotion was critical, just spreading the word whether it was just going into schools and just like, yeah, putting up posters around at shops um, in all different locations. Um, just help people be aware to tune in and... Because it's such a short broadcast, you don't have much time. You've got to get people on day one. We had to just use all the resources we had personally um, to, to get it together. So, yeah, that was a great, great effort, really, just to get on air. And just to, I can't believe we're 30 years on. It's just so long ago. But it only seems like yesterday, really, as well. 
Um, well, Nick, thank you very, very much for your time tonight, and thank you so much for you know all that work you did 30 years ago, without which I wouldn't be talking to you now, most likely. So um, you've, you and Anton both have had a, a lasting legacy for a lot of a lot of people. Thank you so much, Gabs, and uh, again, I want to thank you as well for your your involvement and all, all the work you put in as well with your on air stuff, and also everybody else that was. Um, a part of that uh, amazing time, and uh, yeah, we'll definitely treasure it forever and a day, really. It's just, yeah, a remarkable part of our lives. Now it is time for our second guest tonight. Miff Tramp was there from the very early days of Hits FM in a number of roles, including head of admin, she was the treasurer, uh, she was also involved in the news department, and a whole bunch of other stuff, including looking after the music for the famous Moorabbin broadcast. Let's see if we can get her on the phone. Hello, Miff. Hey, Gabe, how are you doing? I'm very well. Now, the story with you, I believe, is that um, you were doing journalism at RMIT in the early 90s. And this is correct. I believe you had some sort of assignment that took you to Camberwell Town Hall Again, you believe correctly, and you are very well informed. Oh, I've, got, I've got a team of 17 researchers. Oh, did you lose one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you've had to do an assignment. You've got to what, you make some sort of news story. You've gone to Camberwell Town Hall, and what did you find? This was, what, 92? I found Anton. You found Anton van der Lely. He seems to be the man of the moment when the, when the hits, the hits FM story is dug up. He definitely was the man at the moment, and yeah, so we're at this random council meeting about, I can't even remember what we're about, but I knew I had to write a paragraph practice news story for it as part of my journalism degree, and he and I had a very random conversation about listening to Overnights with Tony Delroy on the ABC. Now, I'm guessing that Anton at some point moved the subject from AM radio onto another kind of radio. He did indeed. He mentioned that he was trying very hard to get a test broadcast license to try and start Melbourne Youth Radio with radio aimed to young people. Oh, what and, a crazy idea is that? I don't know, all the young people. And he was very keen to have me join the team. And based on the fact that I was doing journalism, was very keen to have me kicking off the news department. And when we actually kicked off in... December, we, I spent a lot of time going around trying to find things that were relevant to the young people, I really need, and actually spent quite a lot of time at the Richmond Secondary College, Richmond High protest, and one of the great plans was to have them come in on the first day of our broadcast to actually fill in the first half hour of news at about midday, sort of talking about what they were dealing with, why they were protesting, and what they wanted to achieve, and how they thought we could help them with it. And we got to the first day of the broadcast, and we got to the first weekday, and we're waiting for them. And I'm trying to call, and of course, this is pre-mobile. Not a lot of people had pages, and they didn't show. Live radio. What can I say? Well, it's funny because at that point, I think a lot of the people, a lot of our on-air talent, were people who had previous radio experience. And I was thinking about this before. So, for example, we had um, the. Fun and games with Troy and James. Yes. And it felt like we all lived in this main area, but then there were little rooms with offshoots where we have different things. So you'd have that sort of separate home ex section for news, and the studio was obviously separate, but there was this, felt like this big communal area. But then we were sort of using the basketball court to go out and run around and get some energy out, and then we'd run around to the local convenience stores to sort of keep everybody well supplied, to keep everybody functioning. So, of course, we're celebrating tonight 30 years since this um, historic event where, you know, yourself, myself, and quite a few other uh, crazy young folk took over a school for nine days. And um, one thing we should talk about, of course, is the music, because we weren't talking all the time. We actually played a lot of music. And um, we... the music we played at that point was very different to what hits played later on. I was thinking about that today because it was such a different... I think at that point we were trying very hard. It was still very much very youth, very Australian, but we didn't have things in place like the nothing older than five years policy. Yes, that came in later, and yes. That did come in later, and I think at that point too we were very strongly identifying as Melbourne Youth Radio. 
as opposed to Hits FM. So a lot of the stickers from that broadcast were very much Melbourne Youth Radio. This yes. is where my brain's been going today. Yes. But yeah, I think the music was, I think a lot of the music we played in the first broadcast, we certainly didn't play in the second broadcast, and it was long gone by the time of the third broadcast. No, I think we're just trying to reflect what, what we got back on those surveys and um, quite a few of the volunteers were into more of the heavy metal, so that kind of got reflected. Yeah, yeah so we had some heavy metal, we had some alternatives, and people were sort of saying, well, this is what we want, because 92, we were just kicking into a lot of the grunge stuff. Mm. And I think a lot of us, based on our age and everything, we were still quite heavily influenced by Triple J, but there was also a fairly strong Triple M influence. Yep. For us, we Absolutely. didn't really, we hadn't really found out who we were and what we wanted to be at that point. And I think a lot of people probably didn't really sleep for those nine days. No, I think there was a little bit of a lack of sleep. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the other things I haven't mentioned so far is that the studio itself was just a tiny little room. I think it was the um, stationary office for the school. Mm. So I had a little roller door where students would come up and go, oh, I, I need some A4 paper or some HB pencils or whatever. And we kind of took over that little space for that time. I also remember in the lead up to the broadcast, we were all collecting egg cartons. Oh yes, the famous soundproofing. Mm. Total quality with the egg cartons. But I remember we were all madly collecting them. And every time we caught up, we'd all bring all our egg cartons. I'm sure at one point the back of Nick's car was just full of them. And then we had a, a final night where I think it was Anton was hosting again. I think he hosted the first night and the last night. And we had a bit of a, like a, a top 20 countdown for the whole broadcast. Um, and that that's where we had, you know, songs like the Guns N' Roses, November Rain and um, My Name Is Prince and all these other tracks popping up. And there was a little bit of dance at that point, but, you know, nothing like the, the later ones. I think Euphoria was probably the dancer at the time or Too Unlimited. I think you'll find it was probably more too unlimited euphoria it was the summer before. We'd love you, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and of course, that last night we had a, a barbecue outside, and um, we had people singing crazy songs and uh, swap, swapping to the studio back and forth. And I think a number of people may have ended up on a rooftop. I've heard a rumour there may have been people ending up on rooftops, but you know, what what happens? I can neither at... confirm nor deny. What happened at John Gardner Secondary School 30 years ago tonight stays at John Gardner Secondary School. Well, yes, we're all old and daughtery. None of us could possibly remember it. No, no. It's all covered by confidentiality clauses, and uh, ASIO will have me if I mention oh. any of it. Yep, Vegas has got nothing on John Gardner, let me tell you. There's the secrets to all. Miff, thank you very much for uh, reminiscing tonight. It's always a pleasure. And thank you very much for your contribution to this um, tale that we tell each year. And um, I often tell through the, the blog and through the Facebook group of, you know, what we all got up to back then. It's actually really fun looking back and seeing what we did and thinking about how many people we worked with that have gone on to these amazing careers somewhere in the media. And I just think we've been extraordinarily lucky to have worked with these people at the very beginning, when they were still working out what it was they wanted to do and be. Absolutely. There's just so many of them, and they've, you know, gone yeah. and done such interesting things. And these are people that, you know, as you said, they're just working it out, as, as you and I were. We were just trying to work out what we yeah. were doing at the time. So, so we really did luck out to be able to do this thing at that time. And I always kind of see Anton and um, Nick as a bit like a Lennon-McCartney combination. It was just magic that these two people found each other that you know one had a bit more of an engineering bent and one had a bit more of a organizational youth bent and then you know together off we go i think without the two of them it would not have worked because from an engineering and radio perspective anton just had this amazing passion and the skill set to build on but without nick's organization and more importantly nick's people skills it would never have happened yeah, and vice versa. If, if Nick had come up with a concept, you know, he would need he would need Anton's skill set. So it was. Um... It would have been mega. <laughs> would have indeed. Well, Miff, thank you very much for joining me tonight, and um, happy thirtieth anniversary. Wow, happy thirtieth anniversary to our friendship. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
And if you would like to help out this project at all to uh, bring back our fantastic memories of Hits FM in Melbourne, then all you need to do is visit my blog where we have got so much cool stuff. Recordings, news, photos, videos, the whole lot. It is gabemagrah.com. Get on there. And more importantly, tell some friends because um, I haven't got a big advertising budget. But if you can spread the word, we can make this happen. GabeMcGrath.com. See you next time.